Today it's part two of our amazing worldwide exclusive one-on-one -on -one with Brett the Hitman Hart. Today he'll talk to us about some of his not-so-favorite people like Shawn Michaels, like Triple H. And what does he think about what Hulk Hogan had to say about him on this show? Today, one-on-one -on -one with Bret Hart. Bring it on. The record with Michael Landsberg is brought to you by the Keg Steakhouse and Bar. For great steaks, good friends, see you tonight. We are back with Bret Hart. It's part two of our world exclusive with one of Canada's best love athletes. I argued with Vince McMahon on this show. I said he's a Canadian icon. Vince said he's not. I think I have been proven correct given the warmth and the love the Canadians have shown for you. And you have sat on this set in the first show and you showed us all that you are so incredibly far back from your stroke. Thanks so much for joining us. And you know what? It's just great to see you looking so good. My pleasure. Okay, let's talk some wrestling now. Let's talk about wrestlers. Let's talk about Hulk Hogan. He was on this show uh, a short time ago, and he had some nice things to say about you, but he also pointed to the fact that maybe there had been some tension, at least from his perspective. Take a look at this clip, then I want you to comment, Bret Hart. Here's what Hulk had to say on OTR. I love Bret Hart. I love the Hart family. Um, I feel horrible about the tragedy and the, and the problems over the last decade with the Hart family. and. Uh, I just had a very crazy letter come to my house from Bret Hart's manager or agent. And when my book came out, the gist of the letter was, how could you trash Bret Hart at a time like this? And they actually sent an article where Bret had written this unbelievably beautiful article. I don't know when it was, but it said, if there's anything true or real in professional wrestling, it's Terry Bollea. I've seen him with the kids. And the article was unbelievable. And I felt bad to see the article and the guy thinking I was trashing Bret. And this was Bret Hart's manager. And I explained to my wife, I said, I don't understand the letter. I mean, in the book, I just told what happened. So, comments? Well, he's wrong. You know, he, Hulk, um... Nice to know nothing changes. You lay it on the I don't line. certainly want to open up a big thing with him again, because we, I did trash him a lot years ago when I was, and he, he didn't pass the torch to me, and he can go ahead and say it was a misunderstanding with Hulk. That was the Yokozuna thing, right? Yeah, there was, and he says that, like, what happened was, um, um, I was, supposed to wrestle Hogan at SummerSlam for the belt. And we even took pictures, which is maybe he doesn't remember this, or Vince. But I remember we took pictures with a tug of war with the belt for the poster. So we know it was a title match. And so f over the weeks, Vince tells me that Hulk isn't, isn't, gonna, isn't gonna wrestle me because he doesn't want to drop the belt to me. And so I confronted Hulk on it, and we had a big blow off about it. And then we go and confront Vince, and Vince goes, it's a non-title match, and I'm going, since when, you know? Because I knew that um, it was set to be a title match, and uh, so then I, after, I kind of got over that, and of course, Yoko got the belt, and people, it's not so much the belt, people don't understand, it's not the belt. The belt in those days was not contracts and stuff. The, the champion is the highest paid guy in the company, and when the boss of the company says, you're getting the belt, it means I've earned the spot to become the highest paid guy in the company, and Hulk Hogan takes it upon himself to redirect my fate and say, no, you're not getting it. He's going to get the main event money and you're still on the middle of the card or wherever. And I certainly think I worked hard enough to, to earn that spot. And I think it would have been a great historical match. So he, I did kind of knock him for years about being a bad actor. I don't know if I said anything wasn't true, but... <laughs> but... But um, when I got to WCW, I sort of saw things a little differently because I felt that Vince tried to railroad Hulk a little bit in the end, maybe even using me to do it. And I thought I feel like I was wearing his shoes a little bit. So were you guys able to work together in WCW? Yeah, we, we, we buried the hatchet and I shook his hand and I never said a bad thing about him or wrote a bad thing about him again. And I wrote a really nice column about him and then he wrote in his book that he doesn't know what my problem is and I always bash him everywhere, hence today. You know, what was the politicking like in WCW? Because I know a lot of people look at, at you when you came over there. You were making a lot of money, and there were people that actually suggested on this show that that was a, a reason for tension. What was it like back then? All I can say it was like a lunatic asylum. And uh, I think of Eric Bischoff, who I like as a person, I really do. And I sympathize maybe with whatever he was dealing with. But Eric Bischoff was a lot like that wizard in The Wizard of Oz, you know, with all the... But he had no, he really had no idea what he was doing. 
they never came up with one idea for me, and any time I did come up with an idea, I was usually turned away, and it was, it was, it was the most screwed up place I ever worked for. And you've worked up in some pretty screw, screwed up places, right? Yeah, it, it was a, I don't know who said, you know, when I think about how much I came, like Vince, you look at what Vince did after I knocked him out in Montreal, he took that whole storyline and built himself into the corrupt prom promoter and made a, you know, basically turned the fortune of the company around through that. And Does if that you piss look at, you off, the fact that, that, that he was smart enough to take the tension that, that he had with you and the fact that you smacked him and the people hated him and turn it into a billion dollar empire? Uh, it, nah, not so much. I mean, it, I, it doesn't surprise me. I always, you know, I, I kind of fi kind of figured he'd do something like that. But I think what disappointed me and maybe does make me angry sometimes is how poorly the WCW used me. I mean, they really, they couldn't have done a worse job. And you think, you know, the, the scary thing is, is, is what they were paying me. They paid me great up until they hurt me. And then, uh, you know, they just, didn't know what to do. Eric, Vince McMahon said to me, he said, WCW will never know what to do with a Bret Hart. And I remember I even said that to him in Florida. I said, you're so right. They didn't have a clue what to do with me from the second I got. I think there was a lot of people that were stabbing me in the back behind closed doors. Who was I, stabbing you in the back? I'll never know. I've had people tell Who me that. Think? Um, I, I, I have a lot of people say it was Hogan, but I, I don't necessarily know that. I, Can you have friends in wrestling because, because <laughs> At the very top where you were, it's all about passing the baton to someone else. It's all about worrying about who's going to come up behind you and take it from you. It must be so enormously difficult to have real friends who are similarly at the top with you. Yeah, no, you can have lots of them. It's the guys with the right attitude and guys that respect. I think a lot of the real good workers, like the Hennings. Like who? Like, like, like give me like examples of guys. Because I asked you who stabbed you in the back, but, but who's a guy that you can remain friends with? Even if you got to pass the baton to him or he's got to give it to you, it's still friendship above and beyond. Oh, lots of them. Like Benoit, Kurt Henning, um, you know, even guys that aren't necessarily great workers, but, but um, guys with a good attitude and try hard. And, you know, I never had a problem about winning or losing in a wrestling match, contrary to what people might try to say today. But I mean, I never ever had a problem with that. As long as I understood that the guy that I was wrestling was willing to do the same thing for me, if it came down to it. Like, I don't, I didn't even, I wouldn't care about tossing a coin for a wrestling match. It was, it was, a, it was, um, it was a bit of a brotherhood. And there was a lot of guys that uh, worked for themselves. Well, I want to ask you about a, a guy who may fall into that category, Shawn Michaels, back in 1997. He was the guy with Vince that you were most pissed off with, and we'll talk about Shawn Michaels, Triple H, and lots more when OTR returns with Brett the Hitman Hart. Off the Record with Michael Landsberg is brought to you by the Keg Steakhouse and Bar. For great steaks, good friends, see you tonight. All right, let's talk about the state of wrestling right now with, with Bret Hart, who is looking good and sounding good. And I want to ask you about Triple H. When you left the WWF back then, he was kind of a minor player. He was an up-and-coming guy, but he was kind of a not minor player. Now, not only is he incredibly big in the ring physically and of stature as well, but also influence in the company. He writes it, he books it, he does an incredible amount of things. Is that a good thing for the company? Are you surprised, and is he up for it? I don't know. I, th I always thought of Hunter as a... Uh uh, a real ass kiss. He had his nose so far up Vince's ass that, uh, and and Sean's, and like he he was never a straight guy. I don't think I don't have much regard for Hunter. I thought he he was a, you know, not a not a straight guy. Never one of the boys. Never one of the guys in the dressing room. He had his own agenda and was a very sneaky kind of cowardly kind of guy. That's my take on him. Par for the course in wrestling though, because because those guys do get ahead. Yeah, unfortunately they do, yeah. But I don't think, you know, I, when I look back at my career, I like to think that I was loved by my, the wrestlers in the dressing room had a lot of respect for me and they, they appreciated the work I put in and they understood that I was a team player. 
And I don't think anyone could say the same thing about a Hunter Helmsley. How about Shawn Michaels? Because he is coming up on this show in a couple of weeks. And whatever you say now, we'll play this clip for him. He was the guy that, that you wrestled against Survivor Series, that took the belt from you, that you felt betrayed you, that you felt was afraid of you in the end. What are your thoughts about him now? Uh, I'd say he was a two-faced, lying chicken shit. And I'm probably being nice to him. And now? Um, I don't think that's a snake that never changes stripes. Um, Hunt, uh, Sean, he was the kind of guy that would make fr friends with you or bury the hatchet with you 10 minutes later and 10 minutes later he'd be out there stabbing you in the back again. He, you couldn't make peace with him. You know, he was, uh, he was a guy, and the guy that was, a, you know, I think he, he had a, Lynn put a new meaning to the word sort of prima donna or self. He had such a huge ego. And, you know, I think you always got to have a lot of ego to become a champion. I'm sure people say, I have an ego. And, uh, and I think you, I do, or everyone does. And if you're going to be a, a, a big star, you have to have an ego. You have to, it sort of comes down to believing in yourself. But Sean was a guy that was very insecure and very, uh, I think, weak as a person. And uh, he... Um, well, let me throw out some other names to you. Stone Cold Steve Austin. He's coming back. What are your thoughts on that? I have nothing but the highest regard for Steve Austin. I think he, was, he worked for everything he got. He was a great, great wrestler. One of the handful of guys that I would love to have wrestled one last time. I don't have a bad thing to say about him. I, I wished I had heard from him all these years. I never heard from him after Owen passed away. And I think he, someone told me he had a hard time with dealing with stuff like that. And I think him and Owen had their their uh, problems when they wrestled each other. And uh, I remember seeing Steve even in Calgary, and I told him, I said that I felt bad that, because when he got hurt and hurt his neck, and he was, he was pretty hurt, hurt pretty badly. And I think Owen kind of, um, Owen used to turn the business off and go home and spend every moment with the family kind of thing. And he didn't really think about Steve and his family. And I, I remember I, I kind of agreed with Steve being disappointed a little, had hurt feelings towards Owen. And I told him, I said, I thought he was right and that Owen should have been a little more considerate and should have called him to see how he was doing. And, but I mean, I, I always like Steve. He, him and I, I have nothing but the highest regard for him. The Rock. Same thing. I, I saw The Rock, the first thing I said about The Rock when I saw him and I watched him for the first couple of weeks, I said, that guy's the franchise. That's the guy that should, is gonna take my spot and become the, and he did. He had everything going for him. He was a, a good looking guy a good body and a, a lot of athleticism and you know being a third generation wrestler he, he he had a good idea what it took to be a wrestler and he was a good guy i don't i don't know what he's like so much today i imagine you know he's had such a rise now that if you were advising him would you tell him to do what he's doing which is to leave the company and go to hollywood and give it a shot or would you tell him to stay or try to mix the two i tell him to do whatever makes him happy you should never be a slave to the business but He's in a position to call his own shots, do whatever he wants. You know, I, I you know, he, but I, I will say that I think of all the guys, I, he, he deserved it. And I, I don't have, I've always been very proud of him and glad that he had the success that he had. I think I got to ask you this question because wrestling fans, no matter what, believe what they want to believe. And they think everything's a work. And they think that in the end, everyone will come back. And, and you still must get asked all the time, you know, when are you going to wrestle again? They asked me that in my wheelchair. They asked you that in your wheelchair. Does it ever shock you how much they really don't buy the reality of the planet Earth? And maybe that's the beauty of wrestling is that it's a diversion. Yeah, maybe, I don't know. I, 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 never, I never mind it, but I, I found it kind of odd. You know, and I, sometimes I find myself going more, you know, strictly in my own mind, like, could I do it again? Like, if I want to set a goal for myself and say, okay, look, one year from now, I am going to come back and I am going to wrestle. Could I do it? And you know, I think I actually I could. I think, being honest, if I want to set that kind of goal for myself, I could, I, could, I could pull myself together physically and actually have one last match. I mean, not, I wouldn't do it because I'm obviously with con concussion problems and stuff like that, and there's a lot of reasons why I wouldn't do it. But if I had to do it, and I, um, you know, if it was something that I could target as a goal to say, could I prepare myself for it? Yeah, but I mean, I, I have no desire or interest in ever doing that. And, uh... and if you were going to wrestle one more time, 
and you needed someone that you could trust, as you do every time you get in the ring, but in this case, special circumstances. One match, one time, who is it? Well, I would have said Kurt Henning up until now. I'd have probably top of my head say Benoit, because he's sort of my favorite, but I, I would love to have wrestled Kurt Angle. I think he's, he's like the one guy that I really love watching and I have a lot of regard for. I've never met him. Bret Hart, the businessman, if you're going to script it, in terms of money, in terms of impact, in terms of pay-per-view buys, who is it? Uh, if I was doing it for strictly the box office, I would... Uh, and, and there are those who have done it strictly for box office. I would probably wrestle Vince, I guess. I think that's the natural, you know. Loser goes to hell match. <laughs> <laughs> well, some would say one of those guys is going to hell anyway. We got a lot more to talk about in this unbelievable interview with Bret Hart. Stay with yes. us. Twelve hundred shows thereabouts. You were on, I think, our third show. I'm not sure. In between those two, I've ever enjoyed one more than this. A smiling, happy, and healthy Bret Hart. A blessing to everybody in Canada and around the world that that has followed your career and loved you so much in the ring. I got to ask you. You got pen in hand because I'd imagine that's how you're doing it. You're writing a book, right? Not the coffee table book, which will be coming out as well, but the inside story. Is that correct? Yeah, I, I think I've, I've, I, you know, I keep reading these different wrestling books. And I keep waiting for someone to um, write it like I am. And thank God, so far, no one has. And I've, um, got a, I've written, I think, one book already. And I'm working on the second one. And I'm just about finished the second, and eventually I'll finish a third one. I'm doing like a three-part book. At so least you've written a book that has not been released yet? Not been released. Not been printed or anything. So I'm you still... say, no one's done it the way I'm doing it. What is that way? Well, I'm putting you right in my shoes. And I'm giving you the real inside. Well, we call them teasers. Give me an idea of, of the kind of stuff you're talking about. Uh, I'm, it's, I'm writing it more like, um, it's very truthful. You know, it's not like any, anything else. It puts you in my shoes from the time I was very small, in my, through my whole family, through my whole life. With, I mean, I grew up with legendary names like um, Sky Lolo and I watched Gene Kaniski wrestle and Luthez and Pat O'Connor. I watched all the old, stars, the, the, great, the great wrestlers of uh, the 60s and the 50s. And uh, to have watched all, even Gorgeous George, who I don't remember, but I mean, I, that was, those, were, those were childhood memories for me, those kind of wrestlers. And, uh, you know, someone like Mankind or Hulk Hogan, they don't understand the history and they don't appreciate the, you know, like even Mankind that. might, but, but they don't really know. It's all, they, went to, they came into the wrestling business in a completely different time and different phase. And um, that, I, I bring all that out, and I think I bring out my family, like growing up in such a strange, like a, it was an odd life growing up with 12 kids in, uh, in, a, in a world of wrestling that I remember. I think most would accept that as being yeah. true. It was an odd it's, life. It's not a nasty book. It's not a, um, it's, it's nothing, if anything, I've bared my soul. You know, I don't take shots at a lot of people. I take a few shots, but... But it's not, a, yourself? it's not a tell-all. How about it yourself, though? Because you know, one of the things that age hopefully does to you, to all of us, is that you, you get to look back and you say, you know what, maybe I wasn't all that. Maybe I made some mistakes. Maybe you know, I was a lot more human than I thought I was at the time. What have you learned? Well, in relation to writing the book, you mean? Or? In relation to your life, as you look back now, you know, the process of writing a, a book, which, which I've never done, um, and probably never will, because I don't have a lot to say, but when you look back with pen in hand, sometimes you're reflective. What did you grow up on? Um, probably my home life and my, with my wife and things like that. And those are probably the only regrets. And I, you know, it's hard to justify your behavior. You know, not that it's bad behavior, but it's... Like life on the road is something that you have to live life on the road to understand the life on the road. It's easy to criticize and, and um, pass judgment, but it's, you can't. I don't think you can. I look at my life on the road and I go, all those years, I wrestled 23 years and most of it I was away from home, maybe you know, 300 days a year most of the time. And that, that's not including travel days back home. And it makes for a pretty tough existence. And, uh, 
On the road, my, my one rule was survival. Do whatever it takes to get home and keep your, your mind. Don't lose your mind doing this stuff. And unfortunately, so many of my brothers in the wrestling business, not my brothers in my family, in the wrestling business, my peers, so many of them are dead today. And they, a lot of them, the wrestling business was so hard and such a grind. And I've said before how the schedule caused a lot of wrestlers to get hooked on painkillers and pills and you had to get up and you had to go to the gym, you had to take something to go to sleep. And, and I think that was part of the lifestyle. And I can luckily say, and including steroids, I mean, I can say I, I stepped around all that and I maybe got into other trouble, but the trouble I got into, I'm still alive. You know? And we're happy to see that here today. Let us know your thoughts on uh all of the things that we do and nothing we've wanted to do more than this with Bret Hart. Hey, Bret, thanks for giving your fans a chance to hear how things are going for you. It's got to be tough, but so are you. And that was from one folk, but you know what? Millions are thinking exactly that. More in a moment. The end of our second interview with uh, Bret Hart who so graciously agreed to give us this worldwide exclusive. Thank you so much for that. It means a hell of a lot to us. And I know to your fans across the country, watching you, looking so good, thinking so clearly, it's amazing. Great to see you. I'm so glad to be here, really. It's a great opportunity for me to address a lot of things all at one time. So, so tell me this. Uh, you, you said you wrestled for 23 years. Um, you were forced to leave wrestling because of a concussion. Um, you've had the highest of highs and the lowest of lows. If you could go back and turn back the clock, would you have done something else, knowing what you know now? Um, yeah, I would somehow, I think I maybe would have swallowed my pride. A little bit, if I could, if I could do that. I mean, I obviously can't. And, uh, but I always believed that my brother Owen's accident. If I'd been there, that would never have happened. And my people don't understand. People say, "Oh, you shouldn't put that on yourself." But but I can because if I'd been there, like Owen would come to me with everything and say, "Should I do this or should I do that?" And if he'd come to me with that idea, I would have said, "What are you crazy? Don't put your life on the line for the." You know, it's funny when. Uh, when that documentary came out, the wrestling with shadows, I remember Owen was really upset about it. Uh, he loved the documentary, loved it, and came up to me and told me the only thing in it that bothered him is when I said something about, there was some line in the movie about, um, felt like I was, you know, it was like pull, putting a gun to my head and pulling the trigger or something like that. And he, his exact words, he goes, wrestling business isn't worth dying for. I won't ever, and I was like, I wasn't, it wasn't a, a suicide kind of thing anyway, but he just, it really bothered him how much it bothered me, what they did to me or what they were trying to do to me. And when I remember my brother Owen, I think he was so careful and so cautious, I don't know what he was thinking when they got him up there and did that with him. I just that's gotta, about the only regret I ever had. About uh, 20 seconds left, I just got to ask you, people want to know, at this stage in your life, your health, are you happy now? Uh, I'm getting there. I, I am. I am happy, but um, it's it's hard with the stroke. I'm. I'm I'm just getting back to where I was. I was happy the day I was riding my bike before the stroke. Thank you so much Thank for you. doing this, Bret Hart. Off the Record with Michael Landsberg is brought to you by The Keg Steakhouse and Bar. For great steaks, good friends, see you tonight. Michael Landsberg's wardrobe supplied by Grafton and Company. Get it at Grafton. Yeah, I've done this Mordecai Ritz. Yeah. I kind of got stressed out about it, but I...